was a dark void in Nebraska volleyball for months. We're always playing volleyball and for it to just be canceled and not really be able to practice or do anything, it was just, it was just shocking. The more it progressed, the more I realized how intense this was and I didn't really realize how it was gonna impact volleyball. Volleyball becomes a pretty small thing. We're in a pretty surreal time in our country, in the world. We've created a bubble in Devaney for us. We're the only ones that come into this facility. Nobody can get in here. We're all as hungry to coach as we've ever been. We've masked at every practice, and they don't like it, but they do it, and they don't complain about it. It's not only a selfish purpose, it's a bigger purpose of, you know, we gotta get through this as a country, as a, as a world, to be able to move on to our regular lives. And hello and welcome to NET Sports, a special on the state of volleyball in the state of Nebraska. Special not only because of volleyball, but because of who we have here in uh, studio with us. I'm your host, Larry Putney. And volleyball obviously continues to grow and evolve around the state of Nebraska from youth to club to high school, all the way up to the Division I powerhouses in the state. And success is celebrated at all levels. Volleyball has been ingrained into the culture and the fanfare throughout this state of Nebraska. It's earned respect and admiration from folks across the nation. In March, the pandemic swept across the United States, canceling sports seasons and casting doubt and fear of the unknown. In August, the NCAA canceled all fall sports championships and programs across the country, and the entire nation was left in kind of disarray. Multiple iterations of planning and overcoming ever-changing challenges affected coaches and players across the entire United States. However, looking ahead to 2020 run, it brings an opportunity to make up a season lost and the ability to return to the court where sites are set on a national championship by two programs within this state. And to unpack all of this and more, we welcome two of the top volleyball coaches in the nation, Nebraska head coach John Cook, Creighton coach Kirsten Bernthal Booth. Great to have you both with us. Thanks very much. It's nice of you to spend time here. Uh, coach Booth, let's start with you. This is a really broad question, I understand, but talk about the effect on the, of the pandemic on your team, on your season, and what it, where it puts you today. Oh gosh, that's that's a big question. Um, it's been hard, you know. I, it's probably one of the biggest coaching challenges, you know, since I've been coaching. From when it happened, and you know, when they, I mean, from the moment of them packing up, going home, thinking they're going to be back in a couple of weeks, to realizing, okay, we're not going to return in June like we thought. We'll return in July. To you know, literally two days before they're going to return, having to cancel that. So. You know, there's just been a lot of flexibility and trying to, you know, I think, you know, one of our biggest jobs is to portray and, and you know, put this in perspective and, and be positive and try to find good out of a tough situation. And then and then dealing with the emotional loss of losing a season, you know, and putting that in perspective, yeah. of course, because people are losing lives, you know, right. so it's a season, you know, uh, which is a much smaller thing, but it still hurts and it's hard for these young women. It's hard for us coaches. So. So navigating that and um, and then having the carrot in front of us to hopefully play in the spring and letting that kind of drive us to continue to work hard and be motivated. Yeah. Uh, Coach Cook, take us back to August 13th, three months ago. What was your your initial reaction for yourself, your players, your program when you heard the season was, was canceled? Well, we uh, had just started training. We had four days in. It was awesome. Talk about energy, enthusiasm, happy to be there, thinking we're going to have a season and then they pulled the plug, and so I immediately, we just went into uh, plan B, which was get them home, because I, I knew our only chance for a season would be in the spring, and I had to give them a break, because our players, unlike I think Creighton, they weren't there in the summer, ours were there all summer. So we needed to get them out of there, and, and with online classes, they could go, and, and uh, so we gave them a big break, knowing that we would have a kind of a, uh, tail end season and uh, we want them fresh in the spring so that's kind of what we did and it was so I took off everybody took off and and then we kind of gathered back in October. I think we all know you know the the impact of what 
this has caused, but maybe some of the unknown impact to the casual fan or observer. What are some of those, in addition to probably a lot of practice time, the transfer rules, what are some of the others that maybe we, we haven't thought about? Well, what I've noticed, uh, I've seen our players or student athletes react differently to this. Some have handled it really, really well, and some have handled it really tough. And uh, that's one thing. The second thing is missing all the start stop and missing all the training and the conditioning and the lifting. I think our players now realize how important it is to, you know, pretty much be, if you want to play at this level, you got to be in a year round program. And when you get, when everything's shut down, you can't do anything. You know, they say they're working out at home, but they're not. Yeah. And they work out much better in the pack than they do on their own or if they have to quarantine on their own. So I think those are, those are two big things. Ironically, grade wise, we're, we're, I'm seeing the best grades we've ever seen. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And um, so that part has been good. Um, and I just think the, the emotional wear and tear of not being together, not being able to do the things that they're normal, I, it just wears on people. Yeah, similar question. Um, the unknown impact, and then what have you done as you begin to ramp toward a potential season in 2021? Yeah, I think the the impact is is not only our student athletes, but the students as a whole. So cafeterias are closed, so everything's to go. You know, you're masking everywhere. You are told not to go anywhere. And imagine, you know, think of all of our college's experience, college experience. That's not what they want it to be. And I think I saw early in their time they pushed a little bit, and then it got real really fast. And then all of a sudden dramatic changes you know you live in your dorm room a lot more you have your small bubble of friends if you're getting in a car you have to put a mask on and getting them to buy into all those things so so those are all the challenges um and i think it's our job is to get them to buy into the why right like talk about i mean i think the connection has been huge we did lots of different things over the summer i mean we could dive into the different things we did i'm sure coach cook did things when they were at home too but um, of all the things that we did, the one thing that they liked the most was they were assigned two teammates every week to call. There was no agenda. It could be five minutes. It could be 30 minutes. And they said of all the things that they just wanted to connect. So that's kind of what's driven me is to make sure we're connecting, make sure they know they're loved, make sure they love each other. Um, and that's that's been my big fo focus because I just think mental health, we got to it's not just our athletes. It's everyone. We got to protect mental health right now. Yeah, that was the big impact. August 13th, right when we found out we weren't playing. But then fast forward a month on September 22nd, the NCAA decided to move the fall season, the fall volleyball season ahead to the spring, so we will have a season hopefully in 2021 in the spring. For all the details of the new schedule and latest developments, we welcome NCAA Director of Championships and Alliances and University of Nebraska alum, Kristen Fossbender. Well, if anyone at the NCAA is familiar with the crazy state of volleyball in the state of Nebraska, it's Kristen Fossbender. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so what can you tell us about um, the plans around spring? What, what does spring volleyball look like? So spring volleyball, as everybody's kind of looking around and trying to establish how we're going to do this, is starting in January. Uh, we will have the teams will be playing. We do have four conferences actually that are playing volleyball right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, those that aren't playing will start playing in January. Uh, we're looking to have selections on April 4th, which is Sunday night, April 4th. And the championship will be conducted, the final site championship will be conducted on the 22nd and 24th of April in Omaha at the CHI arena. So right now that's our plan. Uh, it looks so like we will we will have 48 teams in the bracket. So it will be a 75% bracket than of the 64. And of those 48 teams, we will have 32 automatic qualifiers. So every conference will get an automatic qualifier as they have in the past. And then we will have 16 at large teams to round out that bracket of 48. Yeah, with the automatic qualifiers, it almost, it, it, it eliminates some of the numbers in some of the larger conferences, right? It, it does. I mean, traditionally, we have a 32 teams at, at AQs and 32 at larges. So this year, it'll be a little bit less. But I do think we're all very thankful that we were able to actually put a championship together and trying to figure out how we're actually going to be able to put together this championship. You know, we weren't sure it was going to happen. Yeah. So even though there's 75 percent of a bracket, that's better than no bracket. So I think we're all looking forward to it. Yeah, I think everybody would agree. It's, it's just good to have volleyball this year. Hey, talk Absolutely. about yeah. Talk about uh, eligibility waiver. So this, uh, the student athletes will be able to, you know, this is kind of, I don't want to say a free year, but a little bit of a free year that they'll be able to play this season and then, you know, be able to come back for another one. A lot of that's going to be working with the institutions and what they're able to uh, provide from their institutions. So those student athletes will be working with their schools on that 
the addition of the the extra year. But uh, I think that's you know nobody knows exactly what it's going to look like. We've seen some stopping and starting already with the teams that have been playing. So giving these student athletes an opportunity to really have a meaningful experience, I think, is what everybody's really trying to do and a safe experience this year. So the member institutions don't necessarily have to fund those that additional year. Is that correct? Correct. They don't. But um, that, it's really up to the institutions yeah. to look and, and see what they can do. And, you know, you have recruiting classes coming in uh, behind them. And so I know there's lots of conversation with signing day happening recently. So I know that's going to be um, an interesting conversations as they work, work through that. So spring championships in 2021 in Omaha, and then Correct. I think you recently announced 2022 back in Omaha. I'll give you a chance to pander here to your former state. Why is Omaha, Nebraska such a great place for college volleyball? You know, Omaha, just there's a great atmosphere. Anybody can tell you that. Anybody that's been to those championships. Uh, I think, too, the committee was really committed to the fact that Omaha didn't get to have 2020 in 2020. And we don't know what 2021 is actually going to look like. We don't know whether we'll have fans in the stands. We don't know what the capacity numbers will be. And so I know the committee was committed to making that best opportunity they could for Nebraska to have an opportunity in Omaha to have the volleyball back in that state and kind of honor the idea that it wasn't what it could be. Uh, and so we hope by 2022, we'll be back to having full arenas. Uh, we're in Columbus in 21, and then we go to Omaha in 22. You certainly hear feedback from your member institutions and coaches all across the country. What are you hearing? I, you know, I'm hearing coaches are excited that there's a championship. Uh, mm -hmm. Coaches are still trying to figure out exactly how we uh, we, we navigate all of this. Um, I was watching some great matches last Thursday, Friday night. I'm sure some of you were too. We saw Texas Baylor play each other twice, um, you know, recently here in back-to-back -back nights. And so it's kind of a little bit of normalcy to see some, some great volleyball being played. Uh, but I think everybody's just really excited for January to roll around and hopefully be able to have their student athletes back on campus. Kristen, great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Thank you. Nebraska native, West Side graduate, Kristen Fossbender. John, I'll start with you. And I'm going to get to the question about spring volleyball and do we eventually move there because we might arm wrestle over this. It'll be a good conversation, so stay with us for that. Let's talk about what the NCAA is doing this spring. Do you like it? Well, ironically, I got asked, uh, well, I'll backtrack here, about probably 12, 13 years ago at the ABCA convention, I got up and presented why we should move volleyball to the spring. So, and then now the ABCA has asked me to do a keynote speech for the virtual Final Four this year on why we should. So I'm a big proponent of moving permanently to the spring. And I don't know if we have time to go into all the reasons, but uh, it, it certainly would, would uh, there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, and some of them are what we're experiencing right now. If you're able to develop freshmen, develop our teams all fall and get ready to play in the spring, and that's a big one as opposed to freshmen coming in, you get three weeks, you're playing. You know, we're playing top 10 teams, Creighton in the first week of the season after two and a half weeks of practice starting school. You got freshmen just thrown in there because we all have to play freshmen. Mm -hmm. And here we go, as opposed to giving them four months to prepare and go. That, that's just one of the reasons. So I, I'm fired up about it. Uh, I would have the schedule a little bit different than what the NCAA did, but... Um, I think it would be interesting to see how this goes. Yeah, well, we have an hour, so we want to hear all of your thoughts on spring. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get there. Um, Kirsten, I'm curious, uh, roster management and the eligibility waiver, how do you handle that? And do you, do you choose to fund all those scholarships that, of individuals who stick around? Kind of talk, walk me through what coaches are dealing with there. Yeah, so as, as Kristen talked about, uh, the fall sports and the winter sports mm -hmm. and the spring sports last year are all getting a year back. So huge implications, as, as what I told all of my athletes, is this is a coup for them. Like, it's so great for them. They have everything in front of them. They can continue on the path that they were on. They could stay at Creighton an additional year if we're able to fund that. Or they can grad transfer. So they are the real winners in this. Um, from a coaching standpoint, it's hard, and I've been transparent with them on that standpoint, too, because um, we have a class that is already committed to come in. So all of a sudden, when you thought you maybe were going to have, in our case, a roster of 15, you might be at a roster of 18. Um, I have a small senior class on scholarship. I'm in a much better situation. One of my counterparts in my league has seven seniors. So do the math on how that affects things. Financially, so schools are given the choice. Some schools are able to financially go over the limit because next year you can go over that 12 scholarship limit. 
Um, some schools aren't, right? So you're dealing with those sort of things. Um, so there's a lot of ramifications to the other big thing is it it's probably the hardest hit kids are the 2021, 22, and 23 class, particularly I think the 2021 and 22s because all of a sudden they have a whole nother pocket of kids competing for those scholarships. So I have counterparts that had to call a 2021 commit and say, we only have a three-year scholarship for you because I'm going to give that scholarship to a senior because that maybe their institution can't go over that 12 limit. So there's some trickle-down effects that are hard, and you know we've just tried to address it with our players and with our recruits. Luckily, that's not a case for us. We've been able to honor what we had committed to, but um, we've just tried to be honest in the process and kind of explain the good and the bad along with it. How about your ability to recruit and seeing players live and oh, gosh. the whole dynamic of – you know, how do you make offers when, you know, I would imagine seeing players live is a big part of that. Yeah, so um, June 15th, after your sophomore year, mm -hmm. you can uh, start talking to athletes. So um, you have a list at that point, you know, of your top kids, and you make communication, and, you know, we can't talk about that class, as you know. So some, you know, you, maybe you make offers, mm -hmm. maybe you don't. Right. Um, but for us, we, we still are looking for a kid in that class, and we have made the decision at this point that we are going to wait and see him live. But I know many coaches are making the decision to make decisions off of film. And then the other ramification, if you have, ki you have many kids making decisions right now, never visiting the campus and really not knowing the intricacies of the program that maybe they're going to go to. And so you, you have concerns that in four years we're going to have a wave of transfers because kids are making decisions without all the information. Yeah. John, early enrollees have always been a big part of, of your program. They've come in early, kind of learned the ropes and ready for fall. Is it a benefit now or is it more of a negative, the early enrollee, because they, they wouldn't be able to participate from a competitive perspective, but certainly, you know, practicing with the team? Well, we think it is, and there's still a chance that rule may change. There's some kickback on that. Uh, that they would be eligible? Yeah. Oh. Huh. Yeah, and that's another discussion. But <laughs> and maybe you, Kristen knows more about than I do, but, uh, um, but we think it's an advantage because, uh, you know, who knows if they're going to be able to play club. And if we get them here, we, you know, they have nine months to prepare for a fall season, assuming we're playing in the fall. So... Give me nine months with somebody as opposed to three weeks. We'll take the nine, nine months. And I just think it's a huge advantage. And, you know, the players that are coming early, they played so many tournaments, so much club. I mean, you can only go to, you know, mm. Tampa, Florida or Disney World so many times. You know, then it's just, yeah. it's, you know, it's not that big a deal anymore. So uh, I think they're ready to move on to college, and it's a great opportunity that when, we, when we can bring them in. If the rule did change, do you think those players would be ready to compete in a spring season? It's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be behind us. You know, we've had a whole fall to prepare. Uh, but um, for some schools, they, you know, that may be really important because, you know, here, here's the deal. Some seniors are already, you know, we've, I've already seen players in the Big Ten. They're, they're done. I mean, they're, they're, they're moving on with their lives. So they're not going to play in the spring. So what happens if you have a couple players leave your program? Then that, that's huge. Mm. So, uh, and then if you're going to allow transfers or international players, you know, why not let everybody be under the same rules? Yeah. So I, I think it's, I think it could help any team, but, you know, we're excited to get them here. And, and again, what people need to understand is you don't decide December 1st that you're coming in January to start school in the spring. I mean, you're two, they're two years out making this decision because they literally have to make up a semester of school throughout that time. So this is a decision they all made two years ago. Yeah. Well, uh, these two coaches have recruited two of the top recruiting classes in the nation, both top five classes. So let's take a look. We'll start with uh, the Creighton recruiting class. So your, I guess your highlight of your class would be the, the setter out of Kansas, Kendra Waite. T talk about Kendra. She's a phenomenal athlete. Yeah, she's um, one of the best setters in the country. Mm. Um, that, as we were talking prior, an incredible track athlete. Yeah. She's one shot put in the 100-yard dash all in the same year. Who duels in that? I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> it's the 100 so, dash and um, the shot put. So a, a pretty uh, stellar athlete. Great, great young woman. I, I think has a high IQ. Um, I think could libero at the Division One level. Um, she's just that versatile of a player. Yeah, you see her accolades there on the screen. Talk about uh, just briefly the rest of the class because this, you know, this is again a top five class in the nation. Well, Norris, this is out of Papillion, so we love getting those local uh, young women. Actually plays club with one of uh, John's recruits. 
Um, just a really versatile player in the sense of can play the front and the back row. And, you know, you love to get those players that can kind of do it all and attack from the back row and the, and the front row. Um, Eve McGill is out of Cedar Rapids Xavier, is coming off a state championship. Um, Six five pin hitter. Six five pin hitter <laughs> uh, has is some you know you know we had pretty good luck with Taryn Close when she you know you can't teach height so right. we think she's got a good arm yeah. um, you know she's going to be a kid that I think it will be fun to kind of watch her development as she as she continues to get better and then we picked up Abby Milner um, this this fall uh, really interested in Creighton as an academic institution and I'm going to be honest I haven't seen her play. No. And so uh, Craig saw her, saw her play, and then again, 20, 2020 hit, and you know I would have gone to to watch her in late summer, and then fall, and everything got delayed. So uh, really excited for her addition to the class. She's a six three middle out yeah. of the Minneapolis area. So that's the number five class in the country. And so let's go to Coach Cook. Um, is this so you you recruited this year the number one, number two, number three ranked players in the country all coming this year? Is this your best class ever? Well, on paper, if you look Numbers, at it yeah. and you look at their accomplishments, you know, I, I just, I've read through the press release. They, they've all accomplished some amazing things. So uh, that gives them a head start, I think, because they've, they've got a track record. Um, and, you know, all of them have played at a really high level. Yeah. So that's good. Now, when we offered them, we didn't know, you know, they were going to be 150, 100. You just don't yeah. know. I mean, because we offered those guys in ninth grade at, at a camp. So... Uh, sometimes the blind squirrel finds the acorn, you know. <laughs> um, but like Kirsten said, uh, these, this class, uh, I'm super fired up because not only are they great players, they are just great people. They're they're very tight with each other. They have great families. It's uh, you know I don't know. There is they've got a vibe about them that is really really unique that I haven't I kind of haven't really. Uh, noticed that in the last few recruiting hmm. classes so there's there's something special to this group and when you're around him you you get you become a part of it and you feel yeah. it and uh, so it's it's pretty cool or's older sister played at iowa rodriguez played on the national team along with or and krause so we're going to take a look at some video of the number two national recruit out of omaha scott lindsey krause uh, just a phenomenal play athletic six four hits the ball so heavy we'll talk about lindsey a little bit yeah well we we identified her I think in eighth grade, yeah. and uh, she was playing middle a lot, and I kept, once we offered her and she committed, I started hounding club coaches and high school coaches, like, hey, she's not gonna be a middle at Nebraska. This, this girl needs to go on the outside, and typically when they're young, you know, and they're tall, she's taller than everybody else, they put them in the middle, and I, and I just saw her, uh, her skill set, her athleticism, that you, it's hard to find that coordinated of girls 6'3", that could and that powerful and so and we're glad she made that move and now you saw what she did in high school I mean it is yeah. pretty impressive I mean yeah. that and that Scott team is incredible and you know you look at this state right now you said it was 23 division one commits right okay I'm looking at the level of play and I mean it's it's incredible and you know so our high school coaches, our club coaches in this state, and there's some great clubs now, you know, uh, and th those have been documented, but the development of these young women to be able to, to turn to this level, that depth in a state of 1.9 million is, is, it's hard to even put into words. Yeah, I don't know if you grabbed my script, but you transitioned me perfectly okay. into my next topic. Let's talk about the local talent in this state, because as you said, uh, the talent here, both in 21 and 22, that was at the state tournament, is phenomenal, and you really capitalized, both programs capitalized on the in-state recruits, and here they are. You have Nora Sis, you know, out of uh, Papillion La Vista, and Coach, the, you know, the three that we mentioned earlier. Talk about, Kirsten, the talent in this state. You know, before we went on the air, we were talking about, you know, I saw talent in D1 that was just phenomenal this year in the state tournament. It is such a deep state in terms of volleyball talent. It's, yeah, it's amazing, and yeah. and and I credit, and, I, and uh, John's probably heard me say, I, I credit that back to Coach Pettit in the '80s. Yeah. You know, him building that fan base, uh, building, and then I think he talked about he made a concerted effort to to teach coaches how to coach. You know, he did a lot of coaches clinics, and and you know those things continue. And it's the trickle down now. So we have incredible coaches in our panhandle, not just our metropolitan cities. Our clubs are fantastic. Um, 
And then little girls see so much great volleyball in the state, you know, between the Division One programs, us and UNO. And then, I mean, we're powerhouses in Division Two, NAIA, Junior College. I mean, I, I consider Iowa Western kind of our school. But, um, but you know, we are we have so much great volleyball, and so many little girls have a chance to look up to these amazing women at all different levels. Um, and it's it is I I, yeah. I did I just watched from from home this year, but loved watching the state tournament because I mean it was across the board great volleyball. Do you? I, I'll ask you both this just a quick answer. I, I would imagine you both get constantly. Well, why didn't you recruit this person? And there are only so many scholarships to go around, right? Why didn't Creighton recruit her? Why didn't Nebraska recruit her? Yeah, and there's. I mean, you can only take so many, <laughs> right. but yeah. the great thing now is the Nebraska girls have a chance to stay in the state of Nebraska and play great programs. Mm. And look out for UNO. They're, they're going to be coming up too. And they're building with, because uh, I saw some players I didn't know playing in the term like, okay, why didn't we recruit her? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. um, yeah. But also I want to echo what Kirsten said about, um, you know, Coach Pettit building this. I think the real switch for all these young girls to be able to watch was when matches started being broadcast on NET. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that you guys do the state tournament, I tell people about that, they don't even believe me that every state tournament match at all levels is televised live, and you guys do an incredible job. But I think once, and I remember, I was an assistant here, we went, Dr. Barb Hibner, who was a pioneer, went and raised $10,000 to televise, I think we were playing Texas or Hawaii or something, on NET, and that's when it started going into every home in this state, and it built from there. Yeah, thanks for the kind words. Yeah, it is, it is remarkable. Creighton, of course, they joined the Big East Conference in 2013, finishing that season as the runner-up. But since that inaugural season, the Blue Jays have won six consecutive conference championships. We visited Creighton's campus to dig into Coach Booth's streak of Big East dominance. <laughs> I love the Big East. It's been like such a joy to like be a part of it the last three years. Just to be able to be competing against those teams, it's really special. I love the cities that we get to go to. We were able to go to Washington, D.C., visit a bunch of monuments, and New York, you get to see Times Square. We went to the World Trade Center, so I think just those experiences just add on to how great Creighton is in the Big East. It's just been really, really fun. I, I think as, as culture has been built, within the Creighton Volleyball program. The fact that we've been able to win the league all but the first year is really a testament to the stamina of the team and the commitment. Another Big East title. Used to this in Omaha. Tack on another year to the banners here at DJ Sokol. Winning the Big East is just something that everyone knows is a goal, so we don't necessarily have to state it, but we take steps and focus on steps that are gonna help us get there. That's one of the things that I appreciate about like Coach Booth and our program here is that we we never really take a game off, like no matter who's across the net, that it's really about our side and being the best that we can be. The senior puts away another Big East title. This year it'll be more emphasis on winning it, so we'll take the steps that um, we need to take in order to get there, and we'll focus on one game, one practice at a time. I mean, I'm going in with the idea that our chance to get into the tournament is at the Big East Tournament. Every year since 12, I think we would have made the tournament even if we didn't win our, our conference tournament. So it is going to be a different level of pressure. We have great young women that work hard every day and want to be good individuals, human beings, in addition to great volleyball players. You know, it's just been a fun ride, and you know, hopefully we can continue to enjoy the journey. Kirsten, to what do you you credit the turnaround six, seven years ago when all of a sudden it just started taking off? Gosh, um, I, I do think we'd been building for mm -hmm. you know for many years now. I think we took a dip in 2011, and at that point we brought in uh, Dr. Widman, who is a sports psychiatrist that has helped our team, and I think you know that that helped. Um, I, th I think the Big East move helped us, and I wasn't sure when we made that move if it would be. Uh, advantageous because the Missouri Valley at the time was a powerhouse mid-major volleyball conference. We would get four or five teams in. Um, but the Big East street cred because of basketball has been huge for us. And then recruiting to those cities, uh, you know, what kid doesn't want to go to D.C. every year, go to New York City each year, Philadelphia each year. So all those things have. And then, you know, we sell, we've always sold uh, 
you know, it's a different academic experience than it would be to go to Nebraska. It's a big school versus a small school. And what I always tell recruits, not right or wrong. It's what's going to be right for you, you know. So it's figuring out, you know, whether, you know, whether this is the niche that's perfect for you. It, and, and again, it's not saying that one experience is better. They're just different. And so that's part of the recruiting process of showing what your differences are and seeing if it's the right fit for kids. Yeah. Coach Cook, uh, 21st year upcoming. Did, uh, I don't know, when you were Terry Pettit's assistant for one year back in 2000, did you think that you'd be here 21 years? No. <laughs> no. How about the level of success you've had? Because it's really, it's remarkable what this program has done. Yeah, and that's, I think, it's the hard thing in anything in life is to be consistently good every day, every year. And, uh, but we have great support. You know, I get told no very little at Nebraska when we, you think we need something or want to do something. Obviously, Nebraska's made a major commitment to volleyball by building Devaney and, and everything that goes along with that. Um, and so, uh, and I've been really lucky to uh, have a lot of great coaches in our program. And you can see the success that they have now that they're leaving and going on to be head coaches. So it's been good. It's been a lot of hard work. And, uh, you know, but like any coach, there's days I think, how do we keep this going and we're going to blow it? And, you know, it's just, you, you always have that voice in your head. Uh, <laughs> but that's also what I think drives us to, you know, to try to be great, be the best we can be. And, and uh, I think one of her players just said it, we're going to take it, we take it one day at a time, one practice at a time. You just stay in the moment and grind. Well, you see the resume there, four national titles, seven conference titles, couple times coach of the year. I, this may seem counterintuitive, but I would assume that you would think that the rise and strength of the Creighton program helps you. No question. And uh, I remember I was hoping she would say that uh, the turnaround was we had lunch at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> she called, you called me up and said, hey, let's meet. And, and we just, and I think it was awesome. And I, you know, that's what I love about the sport of volleyball is volleyball coaches will talk and connect in, in the women's game. Uh, I think, I'm not sure about some other sports that coaches are getting together, but mm. I just felt for the volleyball in the state, you know, and, and where we were at, Anything I could do to, we could do to help Creighton, UNO, the other schools, Doan to Wayne State, you know, that's part of our responsibility is to all work together. And, um, but sh they've done an amazing job and, and it's been fun to watch. And we've had now are having some great matches. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember everybody saying, because I think the first time, well, before you got there, I mean, Creighton was what, 0 and 25 or something. And, and we're playing them. Yeah. And I'm doing it just because. I felt like we got to build volleyball in this state. And I think some of the results, that's why we have Final Fours now in Omaha. And this is, a, this is to me, this is, Nebraska is the volleyball epicenter of the country. Hmm. Well, and I want to add to that, Larry, that when, when I got here in 03, I had an assistant coach that got paid very little, and I had a GA position. And I, I knew I wanted a Husker because I felt like we didn't have credibility at that time. And so I was cold calling uh, former ne Nebraska volleyball players because I thought that would give credibility and I mean you know the end of the story is that I hired Angie Oxley mm -hmm. who's now Angie Barons and we got a kid I'm not kidding in our first class who came who now is an adult of course and she will say I came because I wanted to play under Angie Oxley because wow. she was my hero so um, <laughs> and last year Angie Oxley was assistant coach of the year in the NCAA yes she was yeah. yes it's 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 amazing uh, the coaching trees that have come out of both programs and around the state I'm just uh, so to kind of put a bow on the, the pandemic thing over the last nine months this has probably been a learning experience for both of you what's been the one thing that you have learned about coaching and coaching athletes through this that you might not have known previously or had no way of knowing? JB, go first. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to go. He was looking at you. Um, did you see how you did that? He passed it <laughs> <yeah>. off. <laughs> That's a veteran move there. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I go back to the importance of making sure we connect with them every single day. I think uh, it's a hard time, and, and I have made an, a concerted effort to you know, personally go up to kids and physically, well, I can't physically touch them too much, but mm. pat them on the back and say, how are you? And texting a little bit more and things along those lines. I just think uh, we got to connect. But those are all things that I think are very transferable and I probably need to do more anyway. So um, that connection piece has been really important for me. And maybe I needed it just as much as they did. I mean, it's been hard on all of us. Mm -hmm. 
as I know, Zoom calls are fun for about the first two weeks. And then <laughs> I saw things on Zoom calls that give me nightmares, how our players, I would, you would be so fixated on the Zoom call and what they, how they looked and what they were doing and were they even paying attention. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing that I've tried to instill in our players is, okay, you, you've got to think long term now. And you can't just live in the moment and think, okay, if it's not happening today, then, you know, all bad things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just we gotta, we got to keep just pacing ourselves and know that. And the example I use is Jordan Larson with the Olympics. Okay, it's four years for two weeks. Okay, and so right now we're in nine months for maybe a spring season. Yeah. So I try to give them the mindset of you, this is going to take a long time and, we, and we're not in control, and, but we're going to be prepared and work as hard as we can, and you can't worry about getting rewarded today or, or being able to you know, play a match or something. You're going to have to learn how to grind through this. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, the Zoom call, that's something. Uh, the NCAA shut down fall sports, as you know, and every program had to deal with it a bit differently in the aftermath and kind of what the new reality looked like, including reminding folks to get off mute when they're on Zoom. Coaches and support staff quickly formulated a new playbook for how to navigate the pandemic off the court. Husker Volleyball developed a new way and creative way to focus on team building during COVID-19. <laughs> love to hang out and we love to be together. I think that's what makes our team so strong is our bonds off the court. That was so good. Just try to get their minds off something, do fun, but still make it competitive. So that's why Branch Oak Lake was competitive. The golf thing was competitive. That was our number one goal is try to compete a little bit, make it fun and get their minds off everything going on. We got out there and we were together as a team and the weather was beautiful. Like we had so much to be like thankful for. It really pushed our team outside of their comfort zone because we were, we're so used to like, I don't know, doing things our own way and to have to like work together. And it was, it was fun and it challenged our team. And I think it, it really did give our team time to like do things that weren't volleyball. You guys are competing tonight. <laughs> Our first time cooking as a team together was a hot mess, but it was so fun. And then whisk, 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 whisk. I've definitely been challenged um, to start cooking, and I've learned a lot, and I've burned a lot, so that's been good. <laughs> it's really cool to see these people come back with like new mindsets. This is something we love doing, and we've missed it so much, and I think that has really been a blessing for our team. We kind of learned to be grateful for every practice, every rep, every moment that you have with your teammates, with your coaches, because at any moment it can just get taken away. And um, I think that's definitely kind of influenced us going into these practices lately. They've done a great job of, uh, I think, creating a mindset of what we have to do if we want to be able to play. Did you participate in Masters Day? Yes, I did. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my team did not win, though. So. <laughs> okay. But you want to you wanna see great athletes get humbled watching play golf. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Kirsten, what, uh, what, talk about the things your team has done to kind of, you know, create that unity and bond and, you know, not lose that. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot easier when it was uh, nice outside, so you were able mm. to do things outside. You know, um, we spent a day at uh, Coach Barron's, Coach Oxley Barron's has a great, backyard and pool and the whole thing. So we went there for a day and had homemade pizzas. Um, we've actually coordinated with uh, soccer in particular on our campus and had a dodgeball day at Morrison Stadium on the, the soccer field. So again, a lot of our stuff was kind of tied to the outside. And then it's been somewhat coordinated that the seniors would reach out to the freshmen and just kind of do some small group. Again, uh, it could be getting ice cream or, you know, things along those lines. So. Um, you know, those are the challenges right now. And again, our players are going home now. I think the, 
the Nebraska players may be coming back, but our players are going home at uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas. And so having them be connected and all those sort of things will yeah. be another challenge in front of us. Yep. Well, we talked about this a bit earlier, but the NSAA championships were just held about a week ago and some just really high level volleyball. We didn't have a chance to show some video, so we wanted to just go back and, and review and talk about it. Coach, you said you watched at home and thought, ooh, <laughs> we should have talked to that player. What about that player? Yeah, I watched every match, uh, every level, all, all day long. I was uh, glued to the TV, and because uh, I'm curious, about, you know, how teams play, and the, and again, like you look at D1, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think it was Diller O'Dell. You look at those kids on it. I'm like, okay, they have 27 kid girls in the school, I think. Yeah. And they're putting that kind of volleyball team out there. Remarkable athletes. Yeah. And so. I, d I just I find it fascinating, and it's to me it's a day of celebration of volleyball in this state and women's athletics in this state that we can put something like that on at that at that level. Uh, it's it's just pretty incredible, and um, and then you get some of the the class A, class B. I mean, some of the athletes going to Creighton in Nebraska. I mean, these are these are elite top players, and they're playing at a really high level. I think. I'd love to, you know, maybe you guys next time show 10 years ago what high school volleyball looked like compared to what it looks like now. I think you're going to see a, the level's really high. It's a great idea. I, I would assume going back, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, one of your strategies was keep these players at home. They're going to Kansas and Missouri and other in Kansas State. You, you really kind of built a program on some of these kids keeping them at home. Absolutely. You know, I remember when I just got started, Missouri had a whole slew of Nebraska kids. Uh, and I remember thinking, those are the kids that we've got. And we lost several early on in my tenure at Creighton. But that is absolutely the goal. You know, um, it's hard to recruit against Nebraska, right? But I got to make sure that when we go up against Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, those three in particular, which are all three great pro programs, three great coaches, that uh, we can convince them to stay at home. But there's enough out there to be a top-level volleyball program nationally just within this area and keeping those other kids at home. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's so much talent, and and as now you're not making decisions quite as early, but you you know you were making decisions when they were sometimes ninth and tenth graders. Yeah. So sometimes you hit on a kid, and sometimes you miss on a kid. But those things can change a program if you hit on a kid. Yeah. Well, speaking of um, talent from Nebraska, we caught up with former Husker and two-time Olympic medalist Jordan Larson to discuss the cancellation of the 2020 Olympics and her preparation for the upcoming 2020 21 Olympics. Here's more with the governor. Well, Jordan, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's, as always, great to see you. Where are you right now? Yeah, I am currently in California. We're training in Anaheim, California. And so uh, just kind of waiting to head overseas and kind of what that looks like. Yeah, the overseas part. Let's, let's talk about that, the postponement of the Summer Olympics. What, uh, what challenges did that create for you? But then also what opportunities? Yeah, no, it wasn't obviously the most ideal information to hear. <laughs> um, but I think as a national team, it's been really good for, we had some young players coming in and uh, I think it's been really good to get to know one another better on kind of a deeper level and kind of create a more uh, inclusive bond uh, across all fronts. So um, I think we've used the time wisely and I'm excited. I, I think everybody's eager to get back in the gym and, and compete as a national team because we really didn't get to do that this summer at all. So. Yeah, you, you said you're there training. What? Uh, how have you kept up with the kind of the training regimen to get prepared for 2021? Yeah, so we originally were kind of in small groups, and so we really haven't even been able to play six on six. It's only been like groups of four, groups of six kind of thing, and uh, so just kind of doing the best we can. But honestly, for me personally, like getting in the weight room, pushing weight around, like that for me translates the best. And so I've been putting a lot of time in that. Even when we were quarantined at home, I was doing a lot of that in, in my gym, my gym, I should say my garage, <laughs> and uh, trying to get stronger um, because I know that's going to pay off for me in the end. Let's let's revisit your Husker days a little bit. And I see you're wearing the, the, the garb, so it's, it's good, good to see you. Yeah, you're representing. That's right. <laughs> National championship in 2006, one of the best Husker teams ever. Um, and I understand you recently reconnected with uh, the 2008 team. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, 2006, what, a, what an amazing memory. And obviously being able to do it uh, in the state uh, was even, even better. And uh, gosh, it still gives me chills thinking about it. And then we uh, recently just had a Zoom call with some of the players and it was, oh my gosh, it was so cool to reconnect. And it's so crazy after how many years people still have this like innate feeling and like how special it was. And like, 
you know, I, I spoke on the meeting. I was like, you know how many times I've tried to recreate this feeling? Like, uh, and it's so hard, right? Because nothing will ever be the same and no, nothing will ever match that. And so, but I, I've been chasing that a little bit. Like, how do I create this little like bubble in this niche? And, you know, and I feel like we had that a little bit in 2016 before the Rio games as well. Um, this selflessness, this ability to play for one another. And, um, but yeah, it was super, super special and super fun to reconnect with all those girls after so many years. Yeah, you know, if I think of, you know, great players to come out of the state of Nebraska, you think of Allison Weston, certainly Karen Dahlgren, but I don't, I don't think you get any argument that the best ever out of the state of Nebraska was Jordan Larson. And every year, you know, when we televise the state volleyball championships on NET, we read all the bios from, it has to be more than half or 75% of the players list Jordan Larson as their favorite player or the athlete they admire the most. What, what does that mean to you to have so many young women in this state really looking up to you? Yeah, um, it's very humbling. Uh, I don't know. I never, right. I always dreamed about like, uh, I wanted to be at the university. I wanted to be an Olympian, you know, but I didn't know like what that ground meant or what may necessarily came with it. Right. Like I was just always on this path and, um, you know, all this stuff kind of came along with it. And so, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm grateful for players like Allison Weston, Angie Oxley, you know, all of these wonderful athletes that have come before, because if, if it wasn't for them, like I wouldn't be able to sit in this chair and, and be able to be on the platform that I'm at, you know, or Billie Jean King, even just from day one, you know, women in sport. And so it's, there's so many things that had to happen for, for my path to happen. And so um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still like unusual to me, even when, like when I think about my friends having kids, I'm like, this isn't like, we're not at that phase, <laughs> right? Like I'm still in college, like this isn't real, you know? And so it, yeah. it's just this reality that still really hasn't set in. And I don't know if it ever will. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to think about. Yeah. You know, if you think about just in terms of population, we're 38th of 50 here in Nebraska, and I'm not sure if you've seen this, but five of the top 40 high school volleyball recruits in the nation are from Nebraska this year. I mean, does that surprise you? I mean, just the popularity of this sport and how much it's grown here and the quality of volleyball in this, in this small state. Yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me at all. And I think, um, I think the, uh, Coach Cook has had like great success recruiting within the state. And so I think he knows I'm, and I'm assuming, I haven't seen, I know some of these girls, but I, I'm assuming that they're not just volleyball players, they're athletes. And I think like that's where John has found success, at least that's my viewpoint, is like developing a, an athlete versus just a volleyball player. Because I think that being an athlete like translates so much more like longevity. And uh, I think he sees that in athletes. And I think in the state of Nebraska, we have the ability to be in a lot of different avenues, you know? It's not strictly one sport, so I think in the end, that does pay off for us, and uh, and obviously, just the popularity is for sure like speaks for itself. Um, but for sure, it's uh, not surprising. <laughs> so Olympics next, then what for Jordan Larson? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. Like when you we talk about this path and this journey, and you know what is next. Um, uh, I'm not getting any younger. I can tell you that. And, uh, but it's, uh, we'll see, uh, I, I might get in the coaching realm. I might take a few years off and just kind of evaluate, you know, I've been on this grind now for over 12 years playing professionally all year round. Um, I, I've missed a lot of family time. And so I'm really looking forward to that as well. So still to be announced, uh, still trying to get this team really good and, and hope for a great outcome next summer. Yeah. Well, Jordan, as always, it's great to see you best of luck and let's hope, uh, 2021 comes up gold. Yeah, seriously, thank you. <laughs> yeah, truly one of the best players, high school prep players to ever come out of the state of Nebraska. Another prep who came out of the state of Nebraska who's done great things is on your staff. Let's talk about, we, we mentioned briefly, but let's talk about Angie Oxley Barons and what she's been able to do for your program and last year being named Assistant Coach of the Year by the ABCA. Yeah, uh, we call Angie our glue. Um, she is, she truly keeps Creighton Volleyball together and. It's been kind of fun. I mean, she was 22 when she started. I was 27. We were both kids trying to navigate this stuff. And um, it's been really fun to kind of watch her evolution. She's, she really is a good balance for me. She's much calmer than I am. So she'll, before a match, say, you are too amped up. You're freaking the team out. Like, she's been around long enough that she can say, calm down. 
She's always thinking ahead. And then the other thing that I think people don't miss is she's an incredible tactician. Like, um, she she sees nuances of the game. I'm kind of, I, I love, like, lineups and kind of putting the pieces together. She's very good at, like, taking an arm swing and, and breaking it down. And um, I just think she's got little intricacies that a lot of people miss. And she's very, I mean, the players love her, you know, uh, because they trust her. And, you know, she'll take the time to, to, to retrain things and be patient and so that they can, you know, be their best by the time they're seniors. Yeah. You, uh, you coached Jordan for four years. Well, tell me a memory, a thought, anything she said stick out to you? Oh, yeah, there's we, there's a lot. All kinds. <laughs> Basically, her freshman year, I was ready to punt her off the team because <laughs> she was a brat. And, uh, but by her senior year, she became one of the best leaders I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I look back, that 2018, what we had and what she did with that team and the whole story behind that, and that's been documented, is just incredible. And I, you know, to see somebody will a team yeah. with not that much talent uh, to do what they did, um, she became a great, great leader. And so to me, there's a lot of satisfaction in seeing, and I, I see this with Kelly Hunter too is another one, you know, they're, they, they're, just, they're freshmen. They have to adjust to things and, and, and uh, you know, it's different. And then to see how they finish and where they go on, what they go on to do is, is really reward, rewarding as a coach. Yeah. All right, we saved this last topic for last. Um, and because of social distancing, we can't thumb wrestle or arm wrestle or anything. So we'll start with Coach Cook here. Um, you believe that volleyball should be moved to the spring and be a spring sport. Walk us through the other reasons in addition to, you know, the transitioning that you talked about before. So one, uh, developing the freshmen and develop, having a chance to really develop a team and really coach. And I think that will give every coach a better opportunity to have a competitive team. So it won't be just who has the best recruits. The best coaches will eventually be able to catch up to that. That's one thing. Two, beach volleyball. We're the only school in the Big Ten that has beach volleyball. Okay, and everybody says, well, because they can't do it because of weather. Well, if you move indoor to the spring, everybody could do beach in the fall. So that's another big thing. Uh, everybody would have a chance to do beach volleyball. The third thing is December, okay? When we have the Final Four, the regionals, the biggest events, the biggest matches for college volleyball, let's see, the NBA is going on, NFL is going on, hockey is going on, college football is going on, college basketball is going on, and then you're trying to squeeze all this into the month of December right before Christmas. I mean, the timing of that is awful. If we move it to the spring, we'll have way less competition. Most of that is over. You're competing with track, softball, baseball. Mm -hmm. So the TV times would be great. And I think, uh, and I hope KB agrees with me here, combining the convention with the men and having a men's Final Four and a women's Final Four all together, one big convention, it would save money, it would save time, uh, and you could really celebrate the sport of volleyball. And you, know, and you might say, well, men's volleyball. Well, men's volleyball now, there's only so many Division I programs, but I think there's over 100 now, Division II, Division III, NAIA. I mean, it's exploded in the small schools. So that would be another big selling point for me is, is, is having that. And, um, you know, and the, the, the negatives against it are, well, you're going to compete with you know, teams that have to share gyms. Well, basketball starts now October 1st. So you're either sharing gyms October, November, December, or you're sharing gyms January, February, then they're in their tournaments, they're finishing up, or they're going to March Madness, and they're not even playing at home anymore. So to me, the overlap is way smaller in the spring for sharing gyms as opposed to the fall. And so those are, those are there's other ones, but those are some of the big ones right there. Coach Cook says, KB, I hope she agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> I do think if it happened, it would be great to have a Final Four together. Um, I think all the, you know, like a lot of things, I think there's good and bad on both scenarios. So he's brought up the, the whys of why it would be good. I think there's concerns of our high school volleyball is in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, the likelihood of that switching to the spring is very slim, I think, nationally. I mean, not only, I mean, Nebraska, but to make that national move. So now you go up against club. Um, from a practical standpoint, there's some big challenges there from a, you know, a lot of staffs don't have fully funded. You might have one assistant. So now is one assistant recruiting 
and another one is coaching. The other thing, if you go especially to our D2 coaches, our D3 coaches, um, in some Division One, a lot of them are coaching club volleyball. So now a lot of those good coaches are bringing up our youth, and you would have to take them away because that's happening this spring. So a lot of clubs right now are scrambling because they ha either had college athletes or college coaches that were coaching club, and they, they had to say no this spring. So um, it's not so much that I – I don't. I see the merit that that Coach Cook is talking about. I just think when you think of the nuances, there's some challenges that really could be difficult. And is it, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze type of idea that I think need to be processed? We'll leave it there. Well, we, uh, I'd love to have the next show be a debate on just nothing go back and forth. Huh? <laughs> you should be a politician. <laughs> but, I don't think that's a compliment. Oh, I think no, it's a great compliment. Yeah. You should run for office. <laughs> but here's the other thing. Uh, the next idea is I think you guys need to do a, a show on the coaches in the state whose daughters are setters. Oh, or, yeah. Because it it's would be a great show. We see it all the time at the state tournament level. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you so much to both of you. I know there are tremendous demands on your time, especially right now. Kirsten coming all the way up from Omaha. John, you've got it. Tonight you have a spring game that's going to be televised around the state. So I want to say thank you so much to both of you. It's been a great conversation. We clearly focused on volleyball here in the state of Nebraska, and I know the fans love hearing from you. So thanks very much. Thank yep. you. Thanks. Well, the end of 2020 is near, and with the new year comes – a 22-day countdown to what we hope is the return of Division I college volleyball in Nebraska. We look forward to covering these two programs and wish them the very best on the road to the Final Four in Omaha. Special thanks again to Kristen Fossbender and Jordan Larson for joining us on our show, to both of the coaches who joined us here on set. Thank you so much. And for you, thank you so much for joining us. For our entire crew here at NET, I'm Larry Putney. We'll see you next time on your home for volleyball right here on NET.